Good evening. Thanks once again for joining me. Welcome and uh, I appreciate your time. And uh, I hope you will spend some good time with me around the Word of God. We are talking about power and uh, we talked about horsepower, manpower, leg power, uh, coming from Psalm 147, where the psalmist says that God is not interested in the strength of the horse and the legs of a man, meaning that God, uh, our, our own strength is not what God wants. He does not want us in a position where we will rely on our own strength. He wants us in a position of vulnerability where we will rely on him and confess that we need him. Um, and then we, um, we looked at different things like Psalm 147 that I mentioned, but also uh, Proverbs 18.11, the rich man uses his wealth as his security. In my own words now, uh, these principles that shows us that God, you know, people <clears throat> want a place of security where they know they can call the shots, where they want to be in control. And uh, especially, you know, you get people with, with strong personalities that, want, that sort of become demanding and they, in the process, they isolate themselves from really cooperating, being part of the body. And so on. Ephesians 6 verse 10 says, um, In conclusion, be strong, not in yourselves, but in the Lord. God does not want us to be strong in ourselves. He wants us to be strong in Him, in the power He uh, provides and He supplies. We looked at Gideon and we saw that the, 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 the strength that Gideon received was in the words of the angel of the Lord greeting him, calling him mighty man of valor, um, and promising to be with him. That, that was what gave Gideon his strength. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And then we looked at Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul says, When I am weak, I am strong. Uh, God gave him this, this um, thorn in the flesh uh, that, that uh, really gave him a hard time. And, and Paul prayed that this be removed. And then God said, I'm not going to remove it, but I want you to know my grace. And I want you to know my power. And eventually Paul says, well, I'd rather have the power of God together with these hassles than to have it my own way and not have not know the strength of God. And a wonderful piece of scripture, 2 Corinthians 12. And um, <clears throat> verse 10 of, uh, of uh, um, 2 Corinthians 12 says, For my very weakness, this is a Philip's translation, For my very weakness makes me strong in him. For my very weakness makes me strong in him. That is a place where God wants us, not to rely on our own strength and be the mighty man, but to really be dependent upon him. The Amplified says, For when I am weak in human strength, then am I truly strong, able, powerful in divine strength. And we concluded that our strength comes from the Lord. It is his strength that we have to operate in and in which we find our strength. Now let us consider the sources of the strength and the power of God. Uh, that is the ways in and through which this comes to us. We saw in the case of Gideon that, one of, that the source there must be the word of God, especially the spoken word of God. And I, I want to say that I think, well, I want to mention two other sources, two more sources. Uh, and the one is the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So the Holy Spirit 
is definitely a source of power to us. The Holy Spirit. He gives us power which comes from God to perform the will and the word of God. The word for witnesses in this case is a word, the same word that is translated martyrs. martyrs. So it's all about having power to be his witnesses even to the point of death. Even to the point of death. <clears throat> you see, it's not being the mighty man of ministry at all times, but it's receiving the power to endure uh, and, and, and um, the power to, to, uh, to be and to do what God wants us to do. I'm, I'm just thinking of a scripture and I would like to look at it quickly. Philippians 4 verse 13 that we so often um, that we so often mention. Philippians 4 verse 13. Um, I think you know it very, very well. Philippians 4.13, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we, we um, quote that verse and we say, yes, praise God, I can do all things. I am mighty, I am strong, I can do all things through Christ. But look where it comes from. Um, Paul says in verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly now at last, um, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. So Paul is speaking of contentment. Contentment. Now listen to this, verse 12. He's going to explain it. I know how to be abased, abased, and I know how to abound. I know both sides. I know how to have nothing, and I know how to have plenty. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So Paul is not talking from the point of having everything all the time. Paul is talking about knowing both sides. And then he says, in all things I am content. In all things, having much, having nothing, I am content. That's, that's rulership. That's power. That is strength. Not to call the shots and want to demand all the time. But to say, God, I know your strength. And even if I lack, I am content in you. That's the strength that you give me. To be able to handle the things that don't go my way. If you endure. Uh, there's, another, there's another translation or other translations use a word like this. If you tolerate, you will reign with him. If you tolerate, not if you call the shots. If you tolerate, if you can have things, handle things that are not going your way. Then you will reign and rule with him. So um, let's look at the words of Mary to the angels. She said, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. How will it happen? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. This is miraculous. We don't understand how it works, because a birth comes from the seed of a man being deposited in the womb of a woman. That is the way that that God, but now God is, is using something else supernaturally. And how does he do it? He does it through the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Most High working through the Holy Spirit and doing the miraculous. Uh, that's the power of the Spirit. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love 
and of a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Corinthians 10 <clears throat> For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's not tanks and guns or own power, man-made power, but mighty in God. The strength of our weapons lie in God <clears throat> for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Wonderful scripture, but it's a mighty, uh, the, the weapons are mighty in God. The power lies in God. Now, there are certain passages in Paul's writings where he uses the term, the terms us or we and you, making a clear distinction between the servants of God, the apostles or co-laborers of God, and the saints whom have been reached by means of their ministry. So he makes this distinction. 1 Corinthians 3, for instance, says the following. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Listen to this, verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. So you are the object on whom we work. So there's the you and there's the we and the us. Uh, where Paul makes this clear distinction. I just need to clarify this in order for us to understand how this power works and the next phase of the power that I'm going to mention. So Paul distinguishes between the workers being the fivefold ministry or the apostles and the ones receiving the benefits of the labors of the fivefold, bringing them to the full stature of Christ according to Ephesians 4. Okay, so now in, in 2 Corinthians 10, Paul uses the same kind of language. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Our warfare, he's talking about the us and the we. But mighty in God or through God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And then he talks about when your obedience is full. So he's clearly saying, us, we the apostles, our weapons are mighty through God to, for pulling down strongholds in people's minds, mindsets, high places. And he's obviously referring to the ones who receive the benefit from their ministry, the field of God, the building, whatever he called the, the saints earlier on. Um, there's a clear distinction. The, the King James Version 2011 says this, For the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, but through God they have the power to break down strongholds. But through God. It's not the weapons of the world, but through God. But through God. That's where the power comes from. That's the source of the power. So the next form or source of power um, that I want to mention, we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the word. The next form I want to talk about after mentioning this is the power of effective fivefold ministry. The power of effective fivefold ministry and especially apostles and prophets. Especially in prophets. 1 Corinthians 12 um, says, Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Mighty deeds. Acts 2.43 Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So apostles and prophets form the foundation of the church with Christ being the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 2. Apostles and prophets form the foundation of the church. 
Ephesians 2. Apostles and prophets are the recipients of the revelation of Christ, Ephesians 3. And they are the ones whose vengeance will be brought about on Babylon, uh, Revelation 18. So we see the importance of these gifts to the church. Now, a large part of the church, and remember I'm talking about the one source of power of God being fivefold, effective fivefold ministry, and especially apostles and prophets. You see, a large part of the church today believes that there are no more apostles. Apostles, no more. But I want to I say this. If the work of Ephesians 4, bringing the church to the full stature of Christ, the complete man, is not yet accomplished, bringing the church to full maturity, if that is not, and, and I think all of you will agree with me that's not finished yet. If that is not done, not finished yet, not accomplished, why would apostles then be gone? Because God gave the fivefold ministry for this job. If the job is not done, why would, should apostles be gone? What about the till phrase in Ephesians 4 verse 13? It says, till we all come. He gave, apostles, he gave fivefold ministry to the church to equip the saints, etc., etc., till we all come. So there's a till. Or until. If the until is not yet reached, why should the ministry be gone? And so we see that the effective ministry of the fivefold and especially apostles brings a huge flow of spiritual power to the church. I want you to remember this. The effective ministry of the fivefold and especially apostles brings a huge flow of spiritual power to the church. Now let's look at the application of spiritual power. We see that we saw that the sources are the word, in like in Gideon's case, the Holy Spirit, like in Mary's case, and the day of Pentecost, and apostolic ministry or fivefold ministry. Okay, so let's look at the application of spiritual power. At the introduction, I told you that it's not about devil fighting. I'm not on a devil fighting trip. If you want spiritual power for that, you can do it. But God also wants to give us spiritual power and teach us to use it so that we can reach specific goals in our growth and in fulfilling His purposes. For instance, if spiritual power comes through apostolic ministry, you should learn and get to know how to cooperate with this ministry in order to secure the flow of the power locked up in that. To secure the flow of the power locked up in apostolic ministry to your life. To secure the flow of the power to your life. You should know or learn how to cooperate with this ministry that God gave to empower the saints. There are certain specific forms of power that you will not get in any other way. Listen closely, because God has locked it up in the gifts that He has given to the church. The Doma gifts. And that's, I don't want to go into the Greek and all of that. That's Ephesians 4, the fivefold ministry. And as long as we fight those gifts or simply do not use them or imagine they're not there, we will not get what is locked up in them. There are certain facets of grace, for instance, <clears throat> which are locked up in apostles and spiritual fathers that you will never get anywhere else. You will never get anywhere else. That is the way that God has built His church. That's what Jesus is building. And we will have to work together with that. Please, church, that's what we need to do. Cooperate with these ministries and with these gifts so that we can have the full spectrum of power and grace that God has ordained for the church. Let's look at 2 Timothy 1 again. Verse 6, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. I remind you, Paul says to Timothy, stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Verse 7, for God has not given us, there's a four, it flows from the first one. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love 
and the sound mind. So here's another source of power coming to our lives. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. It comes from the spirit that God has given us. How did that spirit come to us? This verse speaks about the spirit that we have received from God. It's a spirit that carries power in it. And even the power to love, which is not generally seen as spiritual power, and the power <clears throat> to maintain a sound mind, something which has become extremely important in our day. Many people lose their mind. They Anyway, but we forget to read verse 6 with it. We have spoken about the importance of the role of apostles and the dimension of spiritual power that they bring to the body. And I want to ice, ice myself on this. Paul implores Timothy to stir up the gift that was in him through the ministry of Paul. <clears throat> and from that comes verse 7, which starts with the word for. So the contents of verse 7 flows forward from what was said and done um, in verse 6. So the spirit that God has given Timothy and which is resident in him obviously finds its working in conjunction with what Paul ministered to him. Let's look at another translation of this verse to get a fuller understanding. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, listen to this, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. God has given you a spirit of self-discipline. So Paul is saying to Timothy, listen to this, and, and I'm talking about the source of apostolic ministry. Timothy, when I laid hands on you, something big and strong was put into you. But you need to stir it up and to fan it into flame in order for it to be available to the body. I put it there through my ministry, the laying on of my hands, or God put it there. It was put in there by that action, by that ministry. But you need to stir it up and fan it into flame. And this thing that is within you has power to give you self-discipline. Or as other translations say, it's self-control. This thing that is in you has the power to give you self-discipline or self-control. Now, self-discipline and self-control is something that is sorely lacking in the church today. Self-discipline, self-control. People confessing to be Christians are so out of order and they Lives are in such a mess. While they have the answer inside of them, they just need to stir it up. But how did it get there? That's the point I want to make. It's an example of the dimensions of power available to us through the ministry of the apostles. Let us not discard this wonderful gift that God has given us as also the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, as we have discussed. Let us not discard the wonderful gift that God has given to us, the ministry of effective fivefold saints, fivefold gifts, as we do, must not discard the power given by the Holy Spirit and the power coming from the Word of God. Jesus says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. So God has given you a spirit of power. Fan it into flame so that you can love as he wants you to love and so that you can have self-control in your life that will show the excellence of your God. The excellence of your God will be shown if there is self-control and self-discipline in your life. That will give you a testimony of the excellence of your God. And to do that, you need power. And to get the power, you need to fan the gift into flame. To get the gift that's in you, it, was, it comes through the ministry of authentic fivefold ministers. So that's, that's the message I want to leave with you today. There are different sources of spiritual power. 
Please do not discard any of these. Maybe you've got your own opinion about the place of the Word of God. Go and look what the Bible says. Even if you don't listen to me, go and look what the Bible says. The Bible says the word that we preach is the same word that carries the immortal seed of God, the incorruptible seed. So the word that we speak carries the very nature and the abilities of God. Wow. Maybe you've got your own opinion about the Holy Spirit. Go and read the word. Jesus said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses. He said to Mary, this thing will happen. The Holy Spirit will cover you, will come over you, will do it. And maybe you've got your own, <coughs> your own thoughts and your own opinion about apostles. Go and read the word of God. And don't discard the power that comes through these three sources. God has put them in place for us to have the power of God in our lives. Whether it comes through the word, the speaking of the word, preaching, whether it comes through the Holy Spirit, uh, coming upon you, giving you the gifts, of, etc. Um, I don't want to stand, you know, I haven't got time to really go into all of that, but go and read the book of Acts. Or uh, whether it comes through the authentic ministry of, uh, authentic ministry of the fivefold. Please let us use it. It's there for our use. I don't mean that bad. I mean that it's there for our advantage so that we can enjoy the power of God in our life and in everything we do. <clears throat> Will you do that? I, I don't want to search for the power of God in a sense that, you know, I want to be the mighty man of ministry and the power of God. Must do, everybody must fall before me when I, you know, when I, whatever. When I arrive on the scene. <laughs> but let us search for the power of God in the sense that He wants it in our lives. Because the power of God needs to cover my weakness and your weakness. The power of God, just like Paul realized at one stage, I cannot always be the mighty man of God. I've got this thing haunting me. But there's only one way that I can live with it if I can know the grace of God and if I can know the power of God. If you can endure, you will reign with Him. If you endure, if you can tolerate certain things that you cannot rebuke, if you can learn to live above these things, you will know what it is to reign with Christ and to have rulership with him. Please let us search for this heart. That's the heart of Christ that he wants us to have. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for teaching us about your power. And God, so many times, We've wanted the power of God to demonstrate it to people and, and maybe we've had this, this deep hidden pride thing of we are the mighty men that we will draw the attention to ourselves. God, today we come to a different viewpoint where we say we respect the power of God. And if we want it, we do need it. And if we want it, we want it on your terms and your way. Teach us to know the grace and the power of God. And that is done in a position of our weakness. Help us not to be strong in ourselves. Help us to leave behind us the, the strong fortress that we have erected. And that we will know weakness to the point where we will also know the grace and the power of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful week. 
and I'll see you next Wednesday. Again, God bless.